Well, good afternoon and welcome to Flinders University's last fearless conversation for 2022, Authenticity and Identity on the Australian Stage. This event is delivered as part of this year's Fearless Conversation series, which over the course of the year has brought together panels of industry leaders and Flinders University researchers to challenge the current rhetoric and create a fearless future. I'm Casey Trelaw, a journalist with Seven News, and I'm pleased to be facilitating the final discussion of the series today, which is supported by Fearless Conversations partners, The Advertiser, Seven News, Hither and Yon, and Uni Super. Now, today we'll be having a fearless discussion about the cultural and social shifts on our theatre stages and the increased demand for authenticity in Australian arts and performance over the last decade. And our expert panel will examine the identity positions of the artists, directors and producers and how their stories and work has evolved to meet the needs of the industry and wider society. To begin with, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which we meet and that we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge and convey our deep appreciation to the elders of all the nations upon which Flinders operates. Feel free to join in the conversation on Twitter using the Fearless Conversation hashtag as well. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our guests for today, Dr. Chris Hay, uh, Flinders University Professor of Drama and an Australian theatre and cultural historian. Joining him is Gail Mellis on the end there. Gail is the creative director of Tutti Arts and is also an award-winning designer, collaborator, thought leader and highly sought after disability advocate and consultant. Please also welcome Nisha Jelp, the director of Single Asian Female, a state theatre company production, currently showing in the Oz Asia Festival for 2022. Nisha is also a co-founder of Rumpus, a community of professional and independent theatre makers, and she is also one half of theatre company Tiny Brick. Last but not least, we have Carissa Lee, a Noongar actor, writer and editor born on Wemba Wemba country. Since graduating from Flinders University in 2010, Carissa has featured in productions with Melbourne Theatre Company, Malthouse Theatre Company, State Theatre Company SA, Ilbajiri Theatre Company. A round of applause for our panellists that we have here today. Now, to get the discussion started, I would like to start with a question for the whole panel. Feel free to uh, jot in when, if you're willing to go first. How many representations of Australia and its people shifted in contemporary theatre this millennium, particularly as the population distances itself from traditional stereotypes and racial cliches? Who would like to go first? Uh, I don't know if I've been alive that long to be able to answer that. I don't think I've, any of us have, but um, uh, I think it's definitely improved. It could always be better. It's my motto, really, when it comes to these things. I think that we're seeing more uh, people of colour, First Nations people, people living with disability and, you know, members of the LGBTQIA plus community. And they're represented in a way that isn't necessarily their role is about to their identity, which, you know, is obviously valid and important, but sometimes, you know, there's people living in the world and I do think we're seeing more of that. And I think there also needs to be equal time spent on ensuring their voices are being heard as well as they're being represented in stories and that would best be done by facilitating those voices. So, but I think we are seeing more hopeful times Gail, for you? Um, yeah, I do think too that we have started to see more of a change. I do think disabled people who cross all demographics, um, we're probably the lowest on the list still. Um, you know, people are still cripping up um, <laughs> more than they should. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing that has changed and is really exciting, we've had a lot of brave and courageous, diverse people who have started calling it out and you know with social media and you know when you're in this profession you are taking risks to do that but I really applaud them because diverse people are sick of being sidelined and want to see that change. And for you Chris how would you answer that question? Yeah I think I'd go back to something that Carissa said which is that we're seeing folks being represented beyond their identity that if you look at the kind of practice that was going on in the previous decade or previous centuries, you see 
characters of diverse identities, but that's the extent of their characterization. And then what we're seeing now, as I think you rightly point out, is that people are transcending those identities and it's not the first character. No, you don't open the dramatist persona and it says Asian character, you know, gay character, right? It's just a character who happens to have various identity positions that intersect in interesting ways or that can make for interesting dramatic situations that are not confined to the parameters of that identity position. And for me, that's that's what's been most exciting to see perhaps over the last decade or so, um, that we've, we've been able to reach a point where uh, identity is not seen as the limit of characterization, perhaps. I think the main thing I'll just add to that is that, um, yeah, in the last 10, 20 years, we're just seeing more different voices being at the forefront of telling those stories. We're seeing um, more diversity in our playwrights in particular, um, being able to write stories um, of other lived experiences that haven't been on our stages as much as they should have been and being able to tell those stories with um, that authenticity that comes with having gone through that lived experience or if not that, that there's far more um, and still more work to do but there's more um, considered effort I think with companies to get consultation, um, to consult with people and, and playwrights reaching out to um, people for consultation when creating new work to make sure that um, you know, characters that they're writing for that really live far beyond their experiences that they're able to, to um, you know, tell those stories um, truthfully, yeah. Now it is called acting, uh, whether in film or on stage, which is essentially the art of pretending to be someone or something that you are not. So why is it important to have representation of diverse ethnicities and differently abled actors inhibiting certain roles on stage in particular? I'm happy to start. And to everybody, I haven't been well, so my brain's a bit foggy, so I have written some notes today, so I'm like, Otherwise, I might not get through a whole sentence that makes sense. Because um, I'm very passionate about this one, because I can't tell you how many times I've been told over the years, why would you train disabled actors? There are no roles for them. You know, um, uh, but basically, um, stories affect how we live our lives, how we see other people, how we think about ourselves and how, um, people see us. So to be a deaf or dis disabled person is to exist within a society where our images and identity are created by beliefs, values, misassumptions and stereotypes by non-disabled people. And I just have to flag here that deaf and disabled people are still way behind on our stages. You know, if we have a wheelchair user in a play or something, sometimes you've got to get the backstory. I know we've just seen the State Theatre Company present something with a disabled person that was different to that, which was great. Um, and for disabled uh, people, we're often played by non-disabled people and we're usually a metaphor mm -hmm. to drive the story. Um, and, you know, and there's lots of variations on that, but, you know, we can be the hero or the super crip. Um, a villain or victim, and often we're there to teach someone else a lesson. Yes. Um, and we've grown up with symbolic obliteration on our stages and screens where we haven't seen people like ourselves. So do you mind if I go on, because I've got quite a few more notes on this one. Um, you know, authentically represented or represented at all. And underrepresentation establishes dam damaging cultural norms that perpetuate the exclusion of disabled people. And to not see yourself tells you that you're not part of society, that you're not value and you're other. Do you mind if I just go on? <laughs> um, and it's so important to see someone like yourself. And it's really crucial that the stories we see on our stages and screens reflects the society we live in. Um, uh, and just seeing yourself rep represented is vital in forming your identity. Mm. Um, and it re set, uh, reinforces your sense of self, particularly as you um, navigate through adolescence and into adulthood. 
And when you don't see yourself, you can't imagine yourself in that particular situation or that place. I know of an eight-year-old child that was so disturbed and upset that they'd never seen an adult character with their impairment type on TV. She didn't think she'd live to be an adult. I mean, I, yeah, and so that's why it's really, really, really important. Um, and I, I think there's also that fear around disability. Mm. And there's been studies done and stuff that more people fear disability than they fear death. Mm. And I'm here to share with everybody today that most Australians will spend seven or eight years with an impairment. So you may be non-disabled now, you're probably very unlikely to get through your whole life being a non-disabled person. And I'm very passionate about it because I had to leave this country to see myself represented or be in a workspace with other disabled people. And, and it hasn't changed a lot. Gail, on that, when it comes to Australia, where, where's our own country at in terms of being able to bring disabled actors onto stage and how can that maybe progress? I, th I think we're quite behind still. We are only just beginning this journey. There are some actors that are breaking through, but uh, not many. And then there are particular types of disabled people that are okay. Um, so <laughs> that makes it difficult. I mean, if, we don't have disabled people getting into our training institutions. We need to address that, and I've got ideas about how we address that. Um, it's really important that disabled people are at the table all the time, because it's much harder, you know, so in writers' rooms and things like that, um, because it's much harder for non-disabled people to perpetuate all the stereotypes if there are disabled people in the room. Mm -hmm. Some will try. <laughs> I've been on the receiving end of that, but it makes it harder. And and a lot of people, for some disabled people, not having the um, opportunity to make train have got to uh, come through different pathways. And we really need to support those different pathways. And, you know, it, it does feel a lot of the time with representation of a, a marginalised person, particularly with, like, people with disability who are in performances and that kind of stuff, you will often see theatre companies go, oh, we'll, we'll program this one and then, yeah. we'll, you know, we've got that one and then we're covered. It's like, no. It's a tick box. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's like the black box they tick the mob and it's, it's like, no, you need to actually have, as you say, stories being told that are indicative of the society we live in and that is, you know, people with disability are living in the society. And, yeah. and, 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 and we're more than our, our bodies. Mm. Our life experience is more than yeah. what's happening in our bodies and minds as well. And yes, yeah, so we've got a lot of work to do, but I would urge any theatre company, an arts organisation, not even to worry about what you're representing on stage at the moment, get disabled people into your organisation across all levels. And again, with other diverse people, because we know diversity brings innovation and good ideas and stuff. So that's another good place to start. Just don't focus on the one thing because we will get there and we will tell our stories mm. and not just play disabled people. Yeah, and, and a lot of the time with representation as well, it, it is not just the token sort of presence. I do feel as though a lot of the time they're in those co-star roles or they're roles that are kind of indicative of the main character's journey. Like yeah. they kind of like how, I don't know, it's like they sort of show oh, this is what can happen, and it affects this person this way, not the actual person that is in question. And it's it's so frustrating. It's really friggin' annoying. And in Hollywood, like for the Oscars, if you play a disabled character, which has been very Hollywood up until recently, and there's, there are changes of thought, um, you have a like a one in two chance of getting the Oscar. So that's great. You've uh, monetized our story, you've cast a non-disabled people. Hold on, what about us playing that role? You know, this, it just goes on and on. Wasn't it just last year that that, that deaf man from CODA, he won an Oscar? He was like yeah. the first person, like yeah. a deaf person to win an Oscar. It's like, yeah. in the year 2021, like what is that? That's yeah. ridiculous. And then we had, I'm going to mention it, Sia, 
her film Music, oh, which was so yeah. bad, and she handled it so badly. Mm-hmm. You know, it, yeah. Just, just for context, I don't yeah. know if you folks have seen that film. What was the name of the film? I don't, film? don't see it. it oh, yeah. Nah. <laughs> she got this dancer, this white dancer. Yeah, um, non-disabled. Yeah, she playing autistic, is that Yeah, it? autistic. Yeah. And they restrained her, like, you know, which, oh my God, it's just so offensive. And, and, and Sia came out and went, oh, we tried autistic people and there are other autistic, you know, like, to handle it really badly. Unlike, just recently, I know it's in the music industry, Lizzo and Beyonce, that use one ableist word in, a, in their lyrics and they jumped up straight away and went, oh my God, this is terrible. They changed yeah. it. Because sometimes other marginalised groups of people, we understand yeah, absolutely. what that means. Well, yeah, and it's, and you know, when, when they're kind of, yeah, there, there seems to be a bit more of an allowance there when it's in the name of art and when it's, you know, a white person that's doing it, it's a little... A little less harsh, apparently. Now, on, on the flip side, increasingly on international TV and film, I know you guys have touched on that a little bit, actors with disabilities and from racially diverse backgrounds are being cast in more conventional character roles where their race or physical differences are scarcely mentioned. Is this occurring in the Australian stage and screen industry? And if not, why? I think it's it's starting to. It's not a lot. Um, like the screen industry has a huge, um, the hugest thing they're talking about is diversity across screen. And we can be very proud here in South Australia, the South Australian Film Corporation, who were the first to release their 10 year diversity strategy. So they're really committed to systemic change, not um, token things. It is so exciting, but it's been happening actually in the UK and even the US, that we've seen that more of that for a long time. And we're just starting to see it here. Mm. But we've got writers that are still writing about the backstory that we don't need. Yeah, a friend of mine moved to Adelaide from the UK several years ago, he has been um, And I, I remember, yeah, when she sort of first moved here and we first became friends, just like her sort of shock at <laughs> what it's like here in in terms of diversity on Australian stages and um, yeah just really getting a sense of how much further we have to go and how behind we are and we've there's been a little bit of catching up over the last few years but there's definitely a lot further to go but you know there are incredible organizations you know like ACT NOW which Jasmine's now the artistic director of or Tootie and um, which uh, you know, working with those artists that have been historically underrepresented on our stages. And um, yeah, there's just got to be more of that. <laughs> and, you know, the larger companies, um, that they're not working in isolation as well, but that there should be more feeding into the main stage. Yeah. Anisha, I've got another question for you. There seems to be a healthy amount of new Australian writing being presented by companies of all sizes at the moment. Single Asian Female, which was written by Michelle Law and has just been directed by yourself, the State Theatre Company, is one example which brings the voice of a new generation of migrant families to the stage. Is this representative of a growing diversity of cultures and stories being told? Yeah, definitely uh, that it's growing. I mean, I think... Um, like never before have have I, you know, even before directing a play, but just had people coming up to me telling me how much that play meant to them personally. Um, you know, how many, you know, Asian Australian artists and, and also just audience members in Adelaide that would be like you've been hanging out for this play to come to Adelaide and, mm-hmm. and to, to finally be able to see our stories represented on a stage. Um, and, you know, also even since the the play going on, just, I mean, the most sort of meaningful responses we've gotten as the team have been from people saying, you know, just like details like um, the taking the shoes on and off, which for some people might be like an annoying time-slowing thing in the show, but has, you know, really meant a lot to to those audience members, which which feel like it's, it's familiar and they're feeling seen and, um, represented in that so um, I think it's you know definitely growing but even for that to be you know single Asian female being like 
for Asian Australian representation on our stages and representation of migrant stories to be such a national kind of groundbreaking work in that way um, in, you know, the 2020s, it's really a sign that there's a lot further to go, you know, when you think of how long Asian Australia, you know, hundreds of years, <laughs> there's a, a long way to go. <laughs> and I think what's the, the real test for us is going to be the next plays, yeah. the plays that come after yeah. your story or what's read as your story. I mean, Michelle's spoken Michelle's. quite eloquently about saying, like, not everything I write is my life, you know. Mm -hmm. It's obviously informed my, my lived experiences. But as companies and as institutions, we have to support those artists through to the play that has nothing to do with their cultural identity yeah. but is written from that, from that viewpoint. And I think that's what we're hoping to see across the next couple of years is that these amazing breakout hit plays that have really activated cultural context are followed up by genuine investment in what else does this person have to say? Mm -hmm. How else can this person um, contribute to our industry? What we need to look to is the kind of institutional dramaturgies that we have in place to support mm -hmm. that to come through mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that it's not just, mm -hmm. as you say, a box ticking one off. Mm -hmm. Chris, we've had a question come through for you. What does gender and cultural diversity bring to the quality of a performance and what difference does diversity bring to the richness of creative works? Gosh, that's a huge question. Um, I think one of the things that I, I want to say in response to that is to think about how we, we thought about a couple of decades ago the, the vogue term in the theatre industry was colourblind casting, mm -hmm. this idea that we should look we should be blind to difference, essentially. You can think of it as blind to any kind of difference. And pleasingly, I think what we've moved towards and what I'd say in response to that question is we've moved towards what artists like Susan Laurie Parks, who's a great um, American playwright, call colour conscious casting and saying that folks of diverse identities come to us with unique powers. And if we can position those in interesting ways within our work, then we open out all these different conversations about seeing things differently, about experiencing the world differently. You talked a little bit about some of those international TVs and film um, shows where artists of colour or other diverse identities have occupied central roles. And it's made people experience the past differently. Mm -hmm. Folks have watched some of those cultural outputs and thought, wow, that, that gives me a different relationship to what I'm watching. And so I think when you see something like um, a female identifying actor occupying a traditionally male identified role, or you see an artist of colour occupying a role that wasn't written as a white character, but was just written as a character, all these different meanings are made available that aren't there otherwise, that just make for this richer experience and make you understand that the world is a much more exciting place than just these singular identity positions. So I think what, what we're really seeing is a way to activate cultural context, whether that's racial context, ability or disability, sexual orientation and gender identity, to add meaning rather than to take it away. Uh, and that gives people so many more access points, so many more ways to experience and enjoy what we're making. I guess the show that comes to mind might be Bridgerton. I think Bridgerton's the obvious example there. And I know a lot of Bridgerton fans were kind of irritated by the backstory that was introduced saying, oh, here's why there are all these people of colour in this world. And, and you saw a lot of fans being like, we don't care. You don't need to explain it away. Just put them there and they immediately bring these meanings to the surface. Mm -hmm. you, you think of some of the amazing work that theatre directors like Wesley Enoch have done in placing actors of colour at the centre of works. Now, I'm thinking here of a work like Fountains Beyond, which is an early Australian play from the 1940s about racial politics that was originally written for a white cast in blackface. Mm -hmm. And Wesley's production was performed by a black cast in whiteface. So without commenting on the racial identities at all, suddenly this work lands differently. Suddenly we're taking a different perspective on it. So we don't have to necessarily create these contortions of what's, a, what's an actor of colour doing in the 19th century, the 18th century, whatever it is. We can simply place these people on stage and allow for those multiplicity of meanings to occur. 
Yeah, I do. There was a staging of, was it King Henry? No, it was King Lear. Um, there was a staging of King Lear like years ago at, it, back in the UK and the, the fellow playing King Lear was a black man and there were so many people that were sort of weird about like, why is he black? What's going on? Oh, it's like, I think you've got to be asking yourself a very different question. But yeah, it's just, it's so odd to me that people would even question it. And I love the fact that the Bridgerton fans were all going, don't explain it because, I mean, who's watching that for the plot? Yes. I mean, really? <laughs> But yeah, it's just, it's, it's wonderful. Fantastic. Now, look, on screen, Australian Indigenous culture and characters have begun to appear in, in genre films and series such as science fiction in Clever Man, uh, horror films like The Moo Guy and the vampire series Firebite, a favourite of mine. How, how can the stage break from more traditional depictions to present more contemporary and imaginative First Nations stories of the 21st century? Tell more black stories, that's basically what I would suggest, or organise ways for um, mob to work with, you know, in cross-cultural collaborations where, you know, people can learn together, which I'm always harping on about because I love those kind of dynamics where cultures can learn from one another, which, you know, not for everybody. But, like, if you look at, like, for example, um, Maine Watt over in Sydney did that show, City of Gold, which was a really not white show. It was not for white audiences, but it was telling a really important story about the state of deaths in custody, particularly in WA where he's from, and and looking at, you know, this is the problem here. And no, it's not just, you know, over policing and, you know, black fellas getting humbugged by cops or being misidentified as perpetrators, but it's also starting in casting rooms because he talks about what it's like as an actor having to be cast as the noble savage, the victim, these kind of old tropes that are really, really enduring and for some reason won't go away. But that's part of the problem is that we've got this misperception of who First Nations people are and how we're supposed to behave. And when we don't assimilate, the results are death or we are living in poverty or we're dispossessed. And shows like that, bring the accountability back to the audience because, I mean, all right, you folks might not do it yourself, but people are complicit in their silence. And it's this idea of you don't get to stand by and watch this happen. You get to watch a black man die on stage and you're going to own that and you're going to know that that's because people don't speak up. And it's stories like that that aren't necessarily for white audiences and they're not very comfortable and it can be really traumatising for mob to watch too. But... We need these stories to be out there to essentially create awareness and to and to find the stories that are important to us and we're able to have those honest conversations and say, look, this is what we really want to say. And, you know, and I think that's that's the question that a lot of theatre companies are starting to make now. Like they're starting to ask that question of what are the stories you want to tell? What are what do you want us to think of you? What do you what's going on? Like, yeah, and I think that's a huge part of that. And all those things too. Um there are parallels to all, all diverse peoples and their stories and, yeah. Yeah, like that, when you, you said that story about that young one, that eight-year-old who didn't think he was going to live because he didn't see himself. Representation, like, is so important for marginalised people and if we grow up not seeing ourselves, we start to think different. Like, I grew up thinking I should be paler and wanted to have blue eyes and it was just it's really messed up when you're a little kid and you're looking for heroes but they don't look like you yeah and it's yeah i think you've really summed up beautifully what this whole conversation is about really if we don't see ourselves that's not good for us yeah yeah now a question has come from the audience whoever is willing to answer feel free to jump in is there still value in writing plays or shows where the story centres on highlighting a certain culture, race or disability? Or does it perpetuate stereotypes or does it help raise awareness? Depends who's writing the story. That, I think that's the, the big thing. If you have a white, non-disabled person, I'm sorry to say this, male, you know, writing a story about any of us, any diverse people, then that, that's where the problem lies because it's great to consult, but if you don't experience and you don't have the ability to cast your own lens, 
on the world, you know, in that play, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, for example, of a play like Anjali Felicia King's play White Pearl, which brings together a bunch of um, Asian women working for a uh, advertising firm in Southeast Asia. And the, the denouement of that play ends with them all telling racist jokes to each other. And they're the kinds of racist jokes that we kind of hear and go, oh, my God, I can't laugh at that. You know, as a, as a white man, I couldn't be seen to do that. But what we see on stage is all these wonderful Asian actresses telling terribly racist jokes and laughing at them at each other and in laughing together. And it comes back to exactly what Gail just said, is that because Felicia has had experiences of racism, because her own experience of the world has been framed by these kinds of racist stereotypes that she's putting on stage, She's able to encourage us to take up a kind of critical position on them. Whereas if I was to write that, I'd simply be recycling old tropes and racist jokes. So it does really come down to the intent. It does really come down to where it's coming from. And the other thing is too, for lots of um, marginalised groups of people, there is a reclaiming of language mm. at some point, which means that that group of people so I use the word crip and crip culture and things like that. Um, but there are certain words that disabled people use about themselves. I've got friends that call themselves freaks and all sorts of stuff. But it doesn't mean everybody can use that language about us. And I think that happens in every group of, yeah. or demographic. There's one word that yeah. comes to mind. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, another question from the audience. Uh, these are coming in coming in nicely. Uh, in order to turbo, turbocharge equality of representation on stage and screen, would a quota system be helpful until a more equal identity balance is achieved? Well, then, then one of them like, reconciliation action plans, they do that, don't they? Like, say so you got to hire a certain amount of people or something. I don't know if that works, but... The quota thing is really... Tricky. There's some parts of me goes, yes, we need the quotas. <laughs> no. And the other part goes, it's not always a good experience for people because you can be going to culturally unsafe places. If the organisation is culturally unsafe, then quotas won't matter because people will leave, they will share their experiences. Um, but I think we have to look at systemic change and how to make the systemic change happen. And I think quotas can still fall into maybe a little bit of tokenism at, at, during this time. That point about being isolated <laughs> in, in organisations as the one person representing a particular demographic. But I mean, I feel like I've kind of benefited from a certain quota of, <laughs> of you know, that I graduated in 2010 from drama school and that was the year that there was this big public outcry um, with Belvoir's um, season when they had the directors of each work walk out on stage and there was one female director amongst, I think it was nine or ten male <laughs> Um And uh, so, yeah, I sort of graduated as a female director right at that point in time. So there was this huge shift in companies trying to um, have pretty much like a 50-50, which I think now is, you know, in the past 10 years since that, is, there's been a huge change in the industry, um, which I've definitely benefit, benefited from. <laughs> um, and so but, we, yeah, as audiences, we have benefited from people like you being able to get opportunity. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Gail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, yeah, I think it's not, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if sort of hard and f fast, but also from the public really mm. it kind of calling attention to it that companies had no choice really but to respond. So, And that's, that's the same with all the diversity staff. Yeah. I'm sorry, majority companies are not going to make huge changes except marginalised groups of people and their allies, you know, let's not forget our allies, start calling people out, calling them out, you know, and then once you get the funding bodies and stuff, that helps when they are on board and they've got policies around this stuff, that can shift people as well. 
Now I'm going to touch on the COVID word. I'm sure it's affected uh, each of you in uh, interesting ways. Of course, it's changed the way the industry had to deliver content and the way audiences consumed it, at least in the short term. What longer lasting impact do you think this will have on the way the Australian story content is conceived and presented? I hope that people continue to create content that can be delivered on multiple platforms in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. You know, and so if we're talking about stage, you know, I can appreciate that not just sitting in an audience with the live audience, you know. Um, what COVID meant uh, for some disabled people, uh, they could actually access stuff like they hadn't been able to before. And for a lot of us, I'm sitting here with a mask on today because I'm one of those disabled people that's very vulnerable to COVID, that the more content I can get that way, no matter what it is, the better. So I don't have to go and sit in an audience because that is really frightening. Mm. I know there's been lots of talk about COVID's over and we'll just get on with it. That is not the reality for lots of people. Mm. So bring on a bit of innovation you know, and, and do it differently. I think we also saw in the, in the COVID times, we really saw a kind of democratization of content creation in a sense yeah. that, that people, because everybody was reduced to the same thing. You know, the National Theatre was having to just upload things to YouTube and so was your teenage kid in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. And equally, they could both be seen by the same people. And so, I think what that really showed us was that gatekeeping organisations have kind of lost a bit of their, uh, lost a bit of their power in this in this world, and that's exciting, because it means that things get seen, that things get produced and disseminated in ways that bypass structures that have historically not allowed for diverse viewpoints or other um, intersectional identities to be as represented, and I hope if we if we can keep hold of that, I hope that we can, that we make the effort to do that, to, to allow for a kind of democratic access to content creation to, to stay a part of what we do as an industry. I noticed a lot more theatre companies are now making um, understudies more of a thing, like um, because, you know, the risk of COVID or some people are suffering long COVID and that kind of stuff. I hope, I kind of hope that sticks around because then, you know, some actors who might be living with disability or have chronic illness or, you know, some kind of situation like that, they're still able to pursue these roles. And if they do need to take a night off, they have that option. So I think something like that is a really good thing that I hope sticks. The other sort of, sort of benefit that came from COVID and live streaming more is um, regional communities' access to work. All the years I did the sort of touring ed shows with State Theatre Company, the number of times would have, you know, teenage age audiences saying that's the first piece of theatre I've ever seen. Mm. Um, you know, it's a bit of a wake up call to, um, and you know, country arts are say are doing amazing work reaching those communities. But um, yeah, and the other thing as well, I think from selfishly from artist perspective is that it means that your work gets you know, seen by more people as well. And it gives artists access to interstate or international audiences. Like I did in the very early days of lockdown, of the 2020 lockdown, like to this really silly little show over Zoom <laughs> with, <laughs> with um, uh, for Tiny Bricks, the company I have with Phil Kavanagh, um, which we, yeah, I was very kind of DIY, but we had, you know, some audience members from like the UK streaming in, which was <laughs> pretty fun to have that. So, um, yeah, there's definitely benefits, but it's also expensive. So it's also something particularly tricky for indie companies to, 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 to be able to do it a high quality as well. So it's just making sure there's support there to make sure that it can continue and doesn't get forgotten, you know. Could you talk to intersectionality? What works or doesn't work when collaborating with people from different levels of privilege and marginalisation? I think sort of the thing that was sort of covered before is, is the idea of having, you know, one person in a room to, to represent a particular demographic and, um, yeah, being the only person in the room and being asked to represent that entire demographic, you know, historically is, and particularly when it's larger companies and there's different power structures within those companies and, and feeling, you know, even having to, like there really has, how we can empower, um, you know, people from, you know, underrepresented 
demographic groups when when they are working with those larger companies that they are empowered to be able to speak about you know the things that are uh that how they're being how things are being represented how the whole actual process of working is because that's another whole thing of of making sure that they're feeling like their voices are heard and that they can speak out if they're things that that don't feel right to them um yeah uh yeah, and, and yeah, not asking one person to be the expert, but, you know, doing the homework and getting other people in and c consultation. <laughs> like, I think, yeah, consultation should try and keep... Just and it, it's also on. hard when you're in a position where you're the disruptor mm. and then you have to be the teacher and really you just want to be getting on doing your job. But that happens to a lot. I'm sure everyone's experienced that. As well. And so that can be exhausting as well. Yeah, especially if you're just there to be an actor. Like if you're the only like actor in the room that is of a certain thing, and they just go, "What do you think about this?" It's like, "Whoa, mate!" Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, like, okay, it's yeah. Like there's some, you know, some people might be in a position that they can do it. Um, you know, they're happy to, but not everyone is has the emotional labour to do that. Like they don't, they don't want to have to do it. It's, it's asking a lot, and I completely agree with Niche. Like. The more the merrier. Get as many people in a room as you can. It's more fun. Like yeah. you just so many voices. It's, it's and and yeah. the thing with Nisha too, being the only person doesn't mean you're the expert. <laughs> you know, like I, I, so I hear that and I often do this thing in training and I go, do not just find the first disabled person you see outside and drag them in <laughs> to consult for you. Because most people only know their own personal experience where some people uh, delve much deeper to actually have um, a broader understanding and understanding of identity politics and those sorts of things. But it, that often what happened. Yeah, we consulted with the disabled person and they said calling the toilets here in wheelie big toilets would be a great fun idea. And then they get a complaint about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a, like like a, a 10 minute conversation. They reckon they're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Phew, we've got, you know, we've got the oh, answers oops. for that. Nice. But I think the, 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 the part of that too, that question about privilege, I think we need to look at our privilege and biases, unconscious biases, much more. And, you know, as a woman, as a proud disabled woman, I hold a number of different identities, but every day when I wake up, I know I'm white and that holds certain privilege. Some people, I've had an experience just recently when I was talking about privilege and some of the responses, they just thought that that meant white people's money. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 it's much bigger than that. And I, you know, I think allies are really important and I think people that are privileged in whatever areas but want to become allies and want to go on a journey and learn and, you know, stand beside people, bring it on. Chris, a question for you. Um, have you seen a shift in the diversity of drama and performing arts students that have come through? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we definitely have seen that. And I think that comes back to one of the things that I think Kale mentioned at the start, which is if you can see it, you can be it, right? So there are, you know, some, we're, we're very um, in debt to the brave students of 15, 10 years ago who went through as the only ex student in their cohort. Mm -hmm. And then someone at a high school came to a graduation showcase and went, oh, great, I can, I can go to that program, mm -hmm. I can do that. I remember working with, um, shamefully, one of the first disabled students in an in a actor training program in an institution where I worked. And the amount of labour that that student had to do about around access, around timetabling, around all these things that the university was like, oh gosh, we can't do that. And this student being like, yes, you can, you just have to do this. <laughs> and then the next year, there were three disabled students in the cohort and suddenly they could marshal more power to make these things happen. And now as a matter of course, we're seeing students of these intersectional identities come through our courses. And I think the other thing that we've really been able to do, and this comes back to a question that you asked earlier around, you know, isn't acting just pretending to be something that you're not. You know, that's a really, for me, that's a really ahistorical view of what acting is, because 
the if you know I'll spare you the etymology lecture, but if <laughs> acting a, as a word comes around in the 16th century, which is a time when women aren't on stage, uh, which is a time when all all that acting is is standing on stage and saying words. There's nothing to do with these identity positions, and I think in the 20th century we're really hung up on this idea of transformation. That the best acting is the acting where one person fully disappears into a character, transforms into something else. And we've realised, and what we're doing in our training institutions, including here at Flinders, is saying acting is not necessarily transformation. That acting is about learning how to mobilise your own identity, how to own your own identity, and to use what's unique about you as the source of power on stage. The graduating students from this year's cohort of drama students at Flinders are doing their graduating showcase today. Um, and they're presenting pieces that they wrote themselves that draw from their lived experiences that allow them to inhabit the most powerful possible position for them specifically on stage. Because that's what they want to show to agents. That's what they want to show to the industry is, hey, I'm this unique person who can give you these things. I shouldn't have to kind of frame that through Shakespeare or through Arthur Miller. I can do that myself because the art of acting is not just transformation. The art of acting is about elevation and about shining a light on something that you don't otherwise see. And I think training institutions, we're just starting to get that we're just starting to say training's not about breaking down everything that's there and turning into this idealised um, blank slate. It's about harnessing what's there, amplifying it and elevating it. And we're seeing that a lot more. That must make the future pretty exciting. So exciting. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's, it's really good because it's going to really indicate, like, I mean, the fact that you're getting these you know, students to create their own work and have those skills, it's so important. And also, it would be amazing in showcase, particularly if you've got really a, like a diverse group, they're going to have a beautiful collection of different stories because, I mean, if they're all a bunch of white fellas. They're all going to sound pretty yeah. bloody similar. <laughs> so I have this really complicated relationship with my mother. We hold you, mate. And can I just say that a um, good dear friend of mine, Jenny Seeley from Grey Eyes Theatre in the UK, who is a pioneer in aesthetic access on stage, this great quote of hers, and she says, well, Shakespeare didn't say Juliet wasn't a wheelchair user. You know, just oh, yeah. letting all that stuff go. And yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think, yeah, having this weird gatekeeping with stuff like that is just, it's a very odd thing that people can do. It's, um, it's nice when people pull it apart. Mm -hmm. Another question that's come through, what are, in your guys' opinion, uh, some great examples of authentic and diverse performances that we can check out at the moment? What's good to go watch and to go and see? Would you like to, <laughs> like to plug your show, Nisha? I could plug my show. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Um, yeah, so Simulation Female is on at the moment, written by the incredible Michelle Law. Um, and yeah, it looks at this story of this migrant family, this mother Pearl and her two daughters, Zoe and May, um, yeah, as they negotiate their identities as single Asian women in Australia um, and very different experiences from each other um, and some similarities. And um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a play that we've had a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of our discussions and rehearsals have been about authenticity and, and trying to really honour the stories and, um, you know, and there have been a lot of lived experiences in the room which have been quite, felt quite close to the work and that, even that's been an experience for some of the artists of going, you know, I've never before had this experience of, of performing in something where it's actually felt so close. It's always been really far away and just kind of imagining myself in this other scenario. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's a beautiful story. So, yeah, mm. there's there's one show that's on at the moment, if you like. Yeah. I'm from Melbourne, so I go see it if you go there in the next couple of days or something. There's a show called Amelia that's really gorgeous. And it's, um, it's got a beautiful, diverse group of, of women and non-binary people, and it's just really stunning. Mm. I think everyone should go see that. Mm. We've probably got about one minute. I just want to sneak one more question in. Is it more complicated pursuing a successful career as an actor in Australia, say, compared to America? 
I think both have their pros and cons. I think over in America, every like especially in LA, everyone's an actor. Like there's just there's you go into an audition and there's like twenty of you, yeah. and you're just like oh. And yeah, I think Australia is is difficult because you know, it has a tendency to use the same actors over and over again too, which I think is a bit of a problem. Uh, but I think yeah, if you're working as an actor, be prepared to have a money job because it, it's it's a struggle. But if you you know. I think you just find a way to finance it, then just do it. Beautiful. Well, we'd like to thank the four of you, our panellists. Of course, uh, Carissa Lee, uh, Nisha Jelk, uh, Gail Mellis and Dr Chris Hay. Thank you so much to the four of you for joining us in this Fearless Conversation. This, of course, is our last Fearless Conversation for 2022. And I'd also like to thank our audience that's joined us here today for their interest in the series. Um, today and throughout this year and we encourage you to reconnect uh, with each of the 11 episodes which are on the Flinders YouTube channel or Flinders University Fearless Conversations webpage. Uh, we've also added these to our dedicated Spotify account for you to listen to as a podcast as well. And remember you can of course keep the conversation going on Twitter as well using the Fearless Conversation hashtag. Thank you once again for joining us and thank you to our panel. Thank you.